Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerSportsBetting.com for premium picks. Look us up in the sports section on Roku. We're there. Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. First, some housekeeping in basketball. You know, the Washington Wizards, I believe you play a hot hand while you have it. Before this series started, I made the argument that you should put some money on Chicago to win the series, but you should also put some money on Washington at 100 to 50, 150 to 1 odds to win the NBA title. The idea was if the casino is crazy enough to give you this kind of leverage, right, then you want to be hedged in the play. So if Washington pulled the upset, you'd be cooking with gas. Well, let me point out, the Wizards have now won the first two games of the series in Chicago. What if I told you the casinos today with Washington up two games to none is still offering you 66 to 1 odds on Washington to win the NBA title? I think you have to take those. In other words, you should already have money on Washington at 150 to 1. Now they're up 2-0. You're still getting 66 to 1? Look, I know Indiana looked great yesterday. I understand the winner of that Indiana series, right? Indiana against the Hawks is going to make it to the second round and is going to face the winner of Chicago against Washington. All right, fair enough, right? But understand that that series is tied. It's 1-1 going back to Atlanta, right? If Atlanta beats Indy, just understand that the Wizards would have home court in the next round of the playoffs, right? Again, that series is tied. If Indy beats Atlanta as expected, as I expect, you're catching Indy at the right time. Indy hasn't been playing basketball commensurate with being the one seed. That's obvious by game one. Just look at Roy Hibbert's numbers from game one. Right? I'm not saying that the Bullets beat the Pacers in the second round. What I am saying though is that the 66 to 1 compensates you for the risk. More importantly, when you're getting odds like that, you can then bet on the other side of the play to get back the money you have placed at risk at 66 to 1 odds. In fact, you can bet on the other side of the play to win back more money, right? And if the Pacers were to beat the Wizards in the next round, you would still make a profit. Now to those of you who believe that Chicago still has a chance to beat the Bullets, right, just mathematically, here again, you can be on both sides of the play. Folks, the casinos today are now offering you 150 to 1 odds on Chicago to win the NBA title. Think about it. Now, Chicago would have to win four of the next five games, right? I agree. It's uphill for the Bulls. No question about it. But think about it. Somebody is going to win that wizards Bull series. Right now, the casino is giving you 66-1 to 1 on the Wizards to win the NBA title. They're giving you 150 to 1 on the Bulls to win the NBA title. So as you put more money on the Wizards, you could even put a dollar or two dollars on the Bulls, right? And literally have a chance at winning 150 to 300 dollars. 
Anyway, basketball bettors too need to realize that these series prices don't last forever, right? So if you are thinking about betting on an NBA series as opposed to a futures to win the whole thing, if you're thinking about betting on a series, you need to place your action now, right? Don't expect these series props to be offered, you know, after game three. Let me also point out another stunning value. And again, these are just value plays. These aren't predictions. These, this is just strategic betting for positions. I believe the Spurs are the best team, not just in the Western Conference, but in basketball. I love the Spurs. I'm not surprised that Greg Popovich won Coach of the Year. But you've got to be kidding me. Dallas is competitive. Dallas won a lot of games in the regular season, right? The casino is giving me 150 to 1 on the Dallas Mavericks right here. Folks, even if you have no money on the Mavericks, my point to you is that first game was competitive well into the fourth quarter. You should at least put view it as a lottery ticket. You're not expecting to win, but what the hell if the casino is going to, you know, give you great odds. You've got to at least put a dollar on it. The Mavericks right now are 150 to 1 to win the NBA title. Folks, they haven't even played game two of that series yet. There's still a possibility that the Mavericks grab home court advantage before they get back to Dallas. I think the odds are crazy. When you see crazy odds, you need to take them if the team is remotely viable. A few days ago, on April the 18th, Dallas was a 40 to 1 long shot to win the NBA title. Now those odds have more than tripled off of one game. Think about it. I think that's compelling value. Again, these are for the value gamblers out there. We're not making predictions saying Dallas is a better team than San Antonio. Far from it. But what we're saying is the casino is compensating you for the risk. Let's talk boxing. Let me say this. Now you know how guys gain weight as they grow older, right? Most of the guys ruling the roost right now at 147 pounds actually gained weight to get there, right? Floyd Mayweather started off in the lighter weights, picked up several titles, has gotten to 147. In fact, Floyd's even picked up a title at 154, right? Manny Pacquiao ruled the roost at lighter weights, picked up several titles, now he's at 147 pounds. He too had the belt briefly at 154 pounds. Juan Manuel Marquez, right, ate his food at lighter weights, right? Now he's at 147 pounds, right? Adrian Broner started off at lighter weights, moved his way up to 147, some would say too fast, too soon. Got dropped twice by Marcus Maidana. Just understand, though, that Adrian Broner really earned his first title at a lighter weight class. Now, that's very different than Sean Porter. Did you know that when Porter started his career, his first fight, was it super middleweight? Yes, 5'7", Sean Porter weighed 165 pounds for his first fight. Take a look at Porter's past record. You're going to see he's been losing weight to make 147, right? In fact, had Porter stayed at 165, the guys he'd be fighting would be the Andre Wards, James the Gales, and Julio Cesar Chavez Jr.'s of the world. Instead, here he is, fighting the Devin Alexanders, the Pauli Malinagis, possibly the Cal Brooks of the world. Right now, the reason I point this out is really a perception issue here. Right? You know, psychology is part of life. How does Porter view his opponents? 
Does he view them as guys his size? Or does he view them as smaller guys with lighter punches? Is Porter, who was extremely aggressive against Devin Alexander and against Paulie Malignaggi, right? In fact, he's aggressive in the second Julio Diaz fight, not the first. Something changed with Porter from the first Julio Diaz fight. Right, obviously his corner and him sat down and said, hey, we got to get more aggressive. I believe if Porter's asked about this, he'll probably say, yeah, I realized I had to get more aggressive. Well, he's more aggressive right now. The question is, if he fights guys like Floyd Mayweather, how aggressive is he going to be? Right? Is he a guy who's going to view himself as fighting a man who physically is smaller than him, who he can just jump in and rough up? That's how it looked to me with the Paulie Malignaggi fight. Now let me just say, Porter, and I thought this was excellent, Porter, rather than be nonstop aggressive right rather than just constantly try to pressure Malinaji so Malinaji could get in a rhythm on his back foot Porter was episodic right you know I like the phrase an ambush fighter Porter's a little bit different Porter seems to me to be a little bit more structured right the ambushes come frequently but the point is Malinaji didn't know when Porter was going to come inside. Porter kept Malinaji guessing. Right? The best way to improve your front foot, in my opinion, is to have a back foot. Right? Have your opponent guessing on when you're going to be on your front foot. Now the million dollar question, and I believe boxing is a political sport where people say the darndest things I don't even believe the speakers believe what they're saying right they're just trying to sell tickets they're just trying to set things up they're just trying to placate and cater to athletes who sometimes need their ego stroke well Richard Schaefer of Golden Boy claimed that Golden Boy wasn't concerned about Cal Brook who are you kidding Cal Brook is dangerous, he's underrated, he moves awfully well, he's big for a 147 pounder, he hits hard, what I want people to do is to look up DeMarcus Corley's comments about sparring with Cal Brook. Now what works on Cal Brook, and I know it's counterintuitive, is a non-stop pressure game. Carson Jones, the first fight, right? A guy who can pressure him and stay inside, I believe, would give Cal Brook a hard time. I'd love to see Cal Brook against prime Roberto Duran, right? Roberto Duran as a lightweight in particular. If we could just ignore weight classes for a second, was a guy who could hunt you down, right? As a welterweight as a middleweight believe it or not Duran fought Marvin Hagler right Duran's one of those guys who gained weight and was able to hang with the best right Duran actually added more movement to his game but when Duran was lighter he was a guy who could smother you right by the way the first Ray Leonard Duran fight gives you an indication of Duran when he's able to smother a fast, flexible, fluid opponent. Right? I believe a Roberto Duran would give Cal Brook all kinds of problems. But understand, Duran knocked on your door, came in your kitchen, and would start to eat. Right? Episodic fighters are different right they're a blitzkrieg they break down your door come in your kitchen grab something out the fridge then run out 
as opposed to guys who hunt you down, right? Julio Cesar Chavez Sr., he would get inside and he wouldn't leave you. I believe those are the kind of guys who bother Kel Brook. A Porter Kel Brook fight to me is up in the air. I don't believe anybody can make a statement that they know with certainty that Sean Porter would beat Kel Brook. I certainly don't. Right? If Sean Porter fights an episodic fight, what he's going to find is that Kel Brook is able to reset quickly. Kel Brook has great feet. Right? You know, even though Porter has spectacular ring coverage, understand Kel Brook moves better than Paulie Malinaji, is two handed, unlike Malinaji. Right? Malinaji's right hand is coming back, but it's not Cal Brook's right hand. Let's not confuse the two. Cal Brook throws short punches. There's a chance that Cal Brook would be able to follow Sean Porter after the ambush. And while I'll agree, Cal Brook can't fight inside, Sean Porter can. Right? But that's a dangerous fight. Whoever is telling Sean Porter that Kel Brook's a walk in the park is crazy. What Sean Porter needs to do is sit down with Kel Brook films and look at them. Now it's my understanding that Sean Porter only has a few weeks to fight Kel Brook. That makes it even worse because Kel Brook is very different than Devin Alexander and Paulie Malinaji. Right? So, put me among those who believes that Kel Brook, Sean Porter is a spectacular fight. That's a spectacular fight. I don't know who wins that fight. You would see two guys with great foot speed, right? Sean Porter to me lately has, as a viewer here put in the comment section to an earlier video, become a Mike Tyson type figure. Right, the problem though is take Mike. Later in his career, there were guys who were able to move with Mike. Right? Kel Brook throws short punches, he can throw them in combination, he hits awfully hard, he has great timing. Right? If he keeps the fight, in the middle of the ring, it's questionable what happens. I'd say this, Julio Diaz, and I still consider this to be an important fight, Julio Diaz went the distance with Sean Porter, right? In fact, Julio Diaz goes the distance with Sean Porter twice. I encourage people to look at the first Julio Diaz fight. Understand, Julio Diaz is a technician. He knows how to slow guys down. I'll agree, Sean Porter is not remotely as aggressive as he has been of late. But understand, there are things guys can do to slow Sean Porter down. Right? If Sean Porter is going to beat Cal Brook, he almost has to hunt Cal Brook down, abandon being an ambush fighter, and literally become a stalker. Right? I believe if it's an ambush fight, he's going to find that the other guy across the ring from him also has foot speed has the faster hand speed hits awfully hard and can reset on a dime right so Kel Brook I know the boxing press loves to beat up on a guy before the guy gets a title shot but Richard Schaefer's comments are completely ridiculous, at least in my eyes. Kel Brook is a serious opponent. If I were Sean Porter, quite frankly, I'd try to bypass Kel Brook, and I would say to the Mayweather people, hey, I'm a hot young boxer right now. People know who I am. I just beat Devin. I just beat Paulie. Put me on your dance card. If I were Sean Porter, even if that dance card had me waiting until after Mayweather, finishes with Madonna and whoever's next. I might sit out until that fight takes place or I might fight 
on the undercard against some opponent who doesn't have punching power, who's not going to knock me out, just so I can get to Floyd Mayweather. But if you fight Kell Brook right now, let's not assume that that's a victory lap. Kell Brook is a real opponent. I would call Sean Porter Kell Brook a toss-up fight. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.